My name is Kevin B. Burke, and I'm the author of Seasonality Revisited, the use of irregular seasonality in quantitative time series analysis and forecasting. This research is based on two simple ideas. First, that seasonality is a quality of time, not of data, and second, that the calendar and the clock are not the only ways to measure time. Let's start by exploring the idea of seasonality and why it matters in time series forecasting. On the most basic level, time series forecasting is based on the theory that past performance is a reliable indicator of future outcomes. The idea is that if patterns repeat consistently in the historical data, they can be expected to continue in the future. To realize the full potential of seasonality, we need to meet two challenges. First, we need to be able to see the seasonal patterns in the data. Second, we need to be able to evaluate if those patterns are likely to improve the accuracy of the forecasts. The current approach to seasonality never considers the second challenge, and it approaches the first challenge from the wrong direction. Seasonality as it's currently defined looks for periodic fluctuations in the time series data, but it focuses on the fluctuations, not on the periods. It effectively treats seasonality as if it were a quality of the data. It does this because it starts with the data. You, or your algorithm of choice, look at the time series data searching for patterns of peaks and troughs. These patterns are analyzed to see if they correspond with any calendar or clock divisions of time based on divisions of the calendar year. This is usually expressed as some kind of harmonic pattern, then it's either included in the forecast or eliminated from the forecast. My research is built on the idea that seasonality is a quality of time, not of data. This is semantically obvious, the definition of season is a period of time. If you approach seasonality from this perspective, you start with time. You choose a seasonal model and overlay it on the data, dividing it into seasons. Every season now has an effect that can be quantified using Cohen's D parameter. The question is whether those quantified effects are significant and can be expected to improve the accuracy of forecasts. Cohen's D, which is commonly used for t-tests, is a standardized measure that makes it possible to compare effect sizes between data sets or studies. It produces a number that describes the magnitude of the effect by considering the difference between the variance and the means. In this case, the difference between the mean values of a specific season and the reference mean of the calendar year that contains the season. That number correlates to a range of effect sizes that include very small, small, medium, large, very large, and huge. Effect sizes of medium or greater are usually considered significant. When using Cohen's D to quantify seasonality, it's not only possible to determine the size of the effect, but it's also possible to determine the direction of the effect. If the seasonal mean is higher than the reference mean, the effect is positive. If the seasonal mean is lower than the reference mean, the effect is negative. This has never been useful before because in traditional studies, each data set has only one effect size. But when evaluating the effect size of seasonal influences, we have multiple effect sizes for each data set. And classifying those effect sizes as either higher or lower than the reference mean gives a more accurate picture of the seasonal patterns and can be extremely useful for quantitative time series analysis. Let's consider this with some actual data. One of the data sets included in my study is 30 years of flight departure data from the Department of Transportation. Any flight that pushes back from the gate 15 minutes after the scheduled departure time is classified as late. Flight on-time performance has a strong monthly seasonal component. Historically, the greatest percentage of late flights occurs during the month of December, and some of the best on-time performance occurs in September. We would expect to see this reflected in the seasonal effect sizes of the flight data, and we do. These are the results for flight delays in December from 1988 through 2017. The actual difference column is the difference between the percent of late departures during the season and the percent of late departures for the year. The percent difference column is the percent difference between the two means. The percentage of late flights in December was greater than the annual percentage of late flights 28 out of 30 years. There are eight very large effects, nine large effects, and seven medium effects all in a positive direction, meaning a greater than average percentage of late departures. These are the results for flight delays in September from 1988 through 2017. 
The percentage of late flights in September was lower than the annual percentage of late flights every single year. There are 15 large effects, 12 medium effects, and 3 small effects all in a negative direction. The amount of data is a little impractical, however. If you wanted to get an overall analysis of the patterns of on-time performance over the past 30 years using calendar month model, you'd have to consider 360 seasons, each with its own effect size. To simplify this, the individual seasonal results can be aggregated using weighted averages, and a single effect size for each season can be determined by comparing the weighted seasonal mean to the weighted reference mean. This way, we can view the average seasonal effects of the entire data set. Here are the results for the calendar month seasonality for the flight on time performance data set. Now, keep in mind the actual difference and percent difference columns in this table refer to the weighted means. We can clearly see that December has both the largest effect sizes for flight delays and the greatest percent difference between the weighted seasonal means and the weighted reference means at 29.31%. The next worst month to travel is June. It has only a small effect, but there's a 14.81% greater than average rate of flight delays overall. Both September and October show significant effect sizes with a negative medium effect, but September shows a 26.68% lower rate of delays, while October shows only a 17.56% lower rate of delays. It appears that this approach of quantifying the effect size of each season using Cohen's D allows us to see the seasonal patterns in the data, so it addresses the first challenge of seasonality. Using Cohen's D to quantify the effect sizes of individual seasons offers significant advantages for quantitative time series analysis. Because the effect size is objective, this approach makes it possible to compare seasonal influences across multiple dimensions. It can be used to compare the seasonal influences within a seasonal model for a single data set. It can be used to compare seasonal influences between unrelated data sets, for example, between flight delays and car crashes. And it can be used to compare different models of seasonality for a single data set to determine which seasonal models offer the most significant seasonal influences. Now that last point may not sound too exciting, but that's because the current approach to seasonality only has a few seasonal models, all of which are based on divisions of the calendar or the clock. Hours, days, weeks, months, and quarters are valid seasonal models, but they're not the only possible seasonal models. To understand why we've only ever considered these seasonal models, we need to consider the limits of how human beings perceive time. We have objective references for everything that can be defined in the three-dimensional world. We understand length, width, height, and weight without needing to measure them. You can easily appreciate the difference between the distance from your house to the deli and from your house to New Delhi. You don't need a scale to know you can easily lift a suitcase that weighs 10 pounds, but not one that weighs 50 pounds. We can't do this with time. Our perceptions of time are entirely subjective. We can perceive the entirety of a ruler. We can't perceive the entirety of an hour. Because of the limitations of how human beings perceive time, we can only understand time if it's expressed in terms of the calendar or the clock. But the calendar and the clock are not the only ways to measure time. And because we can only understand time when it's expressed in terms of the calendar or the clock, we confuse the units of measurement for the thing being measured. An hour is a unit of measurement of time, but we think an hour is a unit of time. We're so dependent on how we measure time that we rarely wonder how we measure time. We can't measure time unless we can establish some kind of external observable objective reference. The external observable objective references used to measure time are celestial. All time measurement is based on the observed cycles of the planets. The calendar and the clock are based on the observed cycles of the sun as viewed from the Earth. A day is the time between one sunrise and the next. A year is the time between one vernal equinox and the next. Even though these events have astronomical explanations, the rotation of the Earth on its axis and the orbit of the Earth around the Sun, we can only measure them by direct observation. That's how the calendar and the clock were developed. The current approach to seasonality can be defined as regular seasonality. All of the seasons fit neatly within the calendar year. 
Each season is uniform in duration, and the seasons repeat every year in the same sequence. I introduced two more models of regular seasonality in this research, both based on the cycles of the moon. Lunar month seasons are based on the sign in which the new moon occurs. A lunar month lasts approximately 29.5 days, although the duration varies throughout the year. There are 12 lunar months in a year, but they don't track with the calendar months because 12 lunar months is approximately 354 days. The moon makes a complete cycle of the zodiac as it orbits the Earth once every 27.32 days. The period of time that the moon occupies a zodiac sign can be defined as a season. Moon sign seasonality is regular seasonality, and each season has a fixed position in the sequence, but the larger containing cycle is a month, not a year. There are approximately 12 non-contiguous instances of each moon sign season in each calendar year, each lasting approximately two and a half days. These three regular seasonality models, calendar month, lunar month, and moon sign, each contain 12 more or less equal seasons. But now things get really interesting because we can begin to consider irregular seasonality. I created two seasonal models based on the cycles of the planet Mercury. The seasons are defined based on the speed, the average daily motion of Mercury, and also the direction of Mercury, either direct or retrograde. The M30 model is based on 30 minute increments of daily motion, and the M15 model is based on 15 minute increments of daily motion. When the speed is combined with the sign of Mercury, the M30 sign and speed model includes 108 individual seasons, and the M15 sign and speed model includes 202 individual seasons. These Mercury-based seasons are examples of irregular seasonality. They're irregular in terms of the duration of each season, and they're irregular in terms of how often they reoccur, because not every season occurs every year. The cycles are definable, and they're observable, and they do repeat, but the pattern of repetition is incredibly complex. I plotted the cycles for a 56-year period from 1975 through 2030. Here are some of the results. The M30 sign and speed seasons can last from one day to 32 days, but almost half of the seasons last from three to seven days. The M15 sign and speed seasons can last from one day to 27 days, and more than half of them last from one to four days. The M30 sign and speed series has 108 individual seasons. Only four of those seasons occur in all 56 years. Over 60% of the seasons occur fewer than 20 times out of the 56 year period. The M15 sign and speed series has 202 individual seasons and not a single one of them occurs in all 56 years. More than half of the M15 seasons occur between 13 and 17 years out of the 56 years. When we look at the M30 sign and speed seasonal model for the flight on time performance, we see some of the worst flight delays occur during the Capricorn D3.5 season, which often, but not always, occurs in the month of December. And some of the best on time performance occurs during the Libra D3.3 season, which often, but not always, occurs during the month of September. We've identified significant seasonal patterns in the flight data, and now we're faced with the second challenge of seasonality evaluating whether those patterns are likely to improve the accuracy of the forecasts. The first problem is while the effect sizes are incredibly useful in time series analysis, they represent relative values. They're all being compared to a reference mean of the total percentage of late flights. That data is not useful when forecasting. Forecasts work in actual values. The forecast has to look at the historical data and predict the actual percentage of late flights for each upcoming season. And there's no way of knowing if that percentage will end up being higher or lower than the annual mean because we can't know the annual mean in advance. When working with effect sizes, medium or greater effects are usually considered to be significant. It's easy to assume that the seasons with the largest, most significant effects will be the ones with the most value in forecasting. But the truth is that when it comes to forecasting at least, effect size doesn't matter. The theory of time series forecasting emphasizes historical consistency. The more consistently a pattern repeats in the historical data, the more likely that pattern will continue in the future. We know that over 30 years of data, the Capricorn D3.5 season has a large positive effect and the Libra D3.3 season has a large negative effect. What we don't know is the pattern behind those effects. 
To see that, we have to consider the original individual effect sizes for each historical instance of each season. That original data is not useful for historical analysis, but it's the key to addressing the second challenge of seasonality and identifying which seasons are most likely to be useful in forecasting because it gives a quick and easy way to evaluate the variance of the effect sizes within each season. If the effect sizes of the historical seasons are consistent, if the variance is low, then it's reasonable to expect the season could improve the accuracy of the forecasts. If the effect sizes of the historical seasons are inconsistent, if the variance is high, then there's no reason to expect that season will improve the forecast accuracy. Let's take a closer look at the Capricorn D3.5 season. We know that over the 30-year data set it has a large positive effect and that it represents the period with the greatest percentage of late flights. But look at the historical effect sizes. The variance here is enormous. The percent differences between the means range from minus 37.57% to plus 96.84%. The effects range from large negative effects to very large and even huge positive effects. They average out to a large positive effect, but this season probably won't be useful in forecasting. The actual percentage of late flights varies too much between seasonal instances. Now let's consider the Libra D3.3 season. Over the 30-year data set, it has a large negative effect, and it represents a period with better than average on-time performance. When we consider the historical effect sizes, the variance is extremely low. Every one of the effects is in a negative direction, so the delays during this season are consistently lower than the mean. The percent differences between the means ranges from minus 8.02 to minus 40.45%. The percentage of late flights during this season is quite consistent between seasonal instances, so incorporating this data into a forecast will probably improve the accuracy for this season. Now we're ready to take a look at the first study in this research and explore the use of irregular seasonality in quantitative time series analysis. The objective of this study is to determine if the irregular seasonal models produce more significant results than the calendar month model of regular seasonality that's currently used in statistics. The overall methodology evaluates the seasonal effect size and variance for each data set comparing nine different seasonal models three regular seasonal models, calendar month, which is the reference, lunar month and moon sign, and six irregular seasonal models, M30 speed, M15 speed, M30 month and speed, M15 month and speed, M30 sign and speed, and M15 sign and speed. Effect sizes of medium or greater are considered significant and variance of a season is considered significant if it's less than 50% of the mean variance of all of the seasons for the data set and model. Because each model has a different number of seasons, the percentage of significant seasons is used as the final metric to compare the different models. I used three diverse and extensive data sets for this study. The first is transportation on time performance, which includes data on flight departures from January 1988 through December 2017. Amtrak delays from July 2006 through May 2018, and at least six years of city bus and light rail on-time performance from Chicago, Dallas, King County, Philadelphia, and San Francisco. The second data set is for car crashes, including data from the Fatality Analysis Reporting System, FARS, and non-fatal but police-reported crashes in California, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, New York City, New York State, and Texas. The third data set is a subset of the larger financial data set that considers the Dow Jones Industrial Average, S&P 500, NASDAQ, Apple, J.P. Morgan Chase, Walmart, Gold Futures, Soybean Futures, and the Federal Funds Rate. When comparing the regular seasonal models across all three data sets, the lunar month and calendar month models were comparable overall in terms of significance, both for effect size and variance. The moon sign model had virtually no significance whatsoever. The irregular seasonal models told a different story. Across the entire on-time performance data set for the calendar month model, 27.78% of the seasons had a significant effect size, medium or greater, so that's the baseline for comparison. For the M30 sign-in speed model, 39.36% of the seasons had significant effect sizes, and for the M15 sign-in speed model, 43.41% of the seasons had a medium or greater effect size. When considering variance, 35.21% of the calendar month seasons were significant, 
45.83% of the M30 sign and speed seasons were significant, and 46.42% of the M15 sign and speed seasons were significant. The results of the car crash data set were comparable, although there was a greater level of calendar month seasonality by effect size, 33.33%, and variance, 39.58%. Still, the irregular seasonal models outperformed the calendar month model for both effect size and variance. The most surprising results came from the financial market study because there was virtually no expectation of any calendar month seasonal influence in that data set. In terms of effect size, 25% of the calendar month seasons were significant, but 39.14% of the M30 sign and speed seasons had significant effect sizes and 41.53% of the M15 sign and speed seasons had significant effect sizes. In terms of variance, only 21.3% of the calendar month seasons were significant, but 27.01% of the M30 sign and speed seasons were significant, and 28.16% of the M15 sign and speed seasons were significant. It's quite clear that these irregular seasonal models reveal patterns in the historic time series data that are impossible to see with the naked eye or any existing algorithm. And while that's certainly worthy of further study, the only thing that matters is whether these irregular seasonal models can improve the accuracy of forecasts. I consider that in the forecast study. But before we can look at the results of the forecast study, we first need to consider the methodology of the forecasts, because creating forecasts using irregular seasonal models has its own set of challenges. Traditional models of forecasting can incorporate seasonal influences, but those forecasts are not based on the historic seasonal values. Instead, seasonal influences are treated as harmonic waveforms generated by decomposing the time series data. The seasonal naive forecast model comes the closest to considering actual seasonal influences because it takes the value of the forecasted season to be the same as the value of the prior instance of that season. In other words, the forecast for next February would be identical to the observed values from last February. More complex forecast methods, including neural network models, can be programmed to consider select historical seasonal influences as well. But none of these applications can truly be called a seasonal forecast because these forecasts are not based on the actual quantified historical seasonal values. Seasonal forecasts can be generated using a moving average of non-contiguous historical data. Using calendar month seasonality as an example, the forecast for January 2021 might be based on the average values of January 2020, January 2019, and January 2018. A seasonal forecast gives a single forecast value for the duration of the season. The forecast value of each season is independent of the forecast value of the previous season. The start of each new season represents a flex point in the forecast where the forecast value can change direction, often dramatically. When working with regular seasonality, this isn't too exciting. In a quarterly forecast, you have three calendar month seasons, so it would introduce two flex points. But when working with irregular seasonal models, it's a game changer. Here we see the daily close price for the S&P 500 for the year 2005. Let's start by looking at how some of the most popular traditional forecast methodologies handle the quarterly forecasts for 2005. These are the quarterly forecasts using the Autoregressive Integrated Moving Average, or ARIMA, method. There are some very small day-to-day -day fluctuations in the forecast, but for the most part, it's just a trend line. The graph shows four individual quarterly forecasts for 2005. That's why the forecasts adjust at the start of each quarter. The early forecast values for each quarter are usually quite accurate, but the forecast doesn't follow the big ups and downs of the actual stock price during the quarter. We see the same pattern with the Exponential Smoothing Model, or ESM, and also with the Holt Linear Trend Model. Here's what the M15 E3 quarterly forecasts look like. The M15 seasonal model consists of 202 individual seasons, which can last from 1 to 27 days. 62 of those seasons occurred in 2005. A quarterly forecast using the M15 sign and speed seasonal model often contains 20 or more seasonal adjustments within the forecast period. As you can see, not only does the Mercury seasonal forecast include significant ups and downs within each quarter, the shape of the peaks and troughs of the forecast often match the peaks and troughs of the actual stock prices. And just to be clear, the blue line is an irregular seasonal forecast 
generated using historical close prices of the S&P 500 prior to January 1, 2005. No existing forecast methodology can generate a forecast signal that looks like this. The forecast methodology is based on a moving average of mean historical values. The mean values of the three most recent historical instances of a season are averaged together to create the forecast for the next instance of the season. Let's take a closer look at two of the forecast seasons to illustrate the irregular seasonality. The first quarter forecast for 2005 includes the Pisces D1.9 season, which maps to March 3rd and 4th of 2005. To forecast for this season, we need to look at the three most recent historical instances of the Pisces D1.9 season. The first Pisces D1.9 instance was from March 5th to March 7th, 2003. The second Pisces D1.9 instance was from March 12th to March 22nd, 2002. And the third Pisces D1.9 instance was from March 28th to April 5th, 2001. So to get three historical references for the 2005 iteration of this season, we have to go back four years. Now let's consider the Sagittarius R1.8 season, which occurs in the fourth quarter of 2005 from November 22nd to 25th. To forecast for this season, we have to find the three most recent historical instances of the Sagittarius R1.8 season. The first instance is December 8th to 10th, 2004. The second instance is November 30th to December 3rd, 1998. And the third instance is December 15th to 19th, 1997. So to be able to forecast for the 2005 Sagittarius R1.8 season, we have to go back a full eight years. I explored several different options to create the seasonal forecast signal. The E3 signal takes the actual mean close price for the season and then adjusts it to bring the lower historical prices more in line with the higher present day prices. The M3 signal is based on the percent difference between the mean close price for the historical season and the mean close price for the historical quarter that contains the season. Because it's percentage-based, it doesn't require an additional adjustment to the forecast value. Now that we've covered how to create the irregular seasonal forecasts, we're ready to look at the actual forecast study. The only thing that matters with forecasts is accuracy. For this study, I used two accuracy metrics, the mean absolute percentage error, or MAPE, and the root mean square error, or RMSE. These two approaches give different but complementary views of the forecast accuracy. My initial hope was that because the Mercury forecasts were able to make adjustments within the quarter, and because those adjustments so often tracked with the changes in the actual stock price, that the Mercury forecasts would be more accurate than any other forecast method. This was not the case. I regrouped and I looked for ways to combine the seasonal forecast signal with the non-seasonal traditional forecasts. Because the irregular seasonal patterns are so complex, the only way to incorporate the seasonal influences in a forecast is to generate a forecast using only the seasonal data, then generate a forecast using a more traditional method, and finally combine the results in some way to create a hybrid forecast that includes the seasonal influences. This created some very exciting results. This shows the M15, M3, and ARIMA forecast for the 2005 S&P 500. And this is the hybrid forecast that combines the ARIMA with the M15, M3 in a one-to-one -one ratio. This shows the M15, M3, and ESM forecasts. And this is the hybrid forecast that combines the ESM with the M15, M3 in a three-to-one ratio. For the final study, I ranked the accuracy of 12 different forecast models. I considered the Mercury-based seasonal forecast on its own and compared it with five traditional forecast models, ARIMA, ESM, HOLT, MEAN, and NAIVE, and then combined the Mercury seasonal forecast with the traditional forecasts to come up with six hybrid seasonal forecasts. I ran quarterly forecasts for a 19-year period from 2000 through 2018 and measured the total accuracy over that entire period using MAPE and RMSE. If the forecasts that include the irregular seasonal signals are more accurate than the forecasts that don't, then there's clear value in using irregular seasonality and time series forecasting. Oh, and I forgot to mention, I didn't just evaluate the accuracy of the forecasts for the S&P 500. The forecast data set includes a total of 430 financial instruments. 10 stock market indexes, 379 individual stocks across every market sector, 
21 commodities, 10 interest rates and bonds, and 10 currency exchange rates. And I didn't just run the study once. The initial study used the M15 E3 forecast signal, but after I completed the research and evaluated the results, I came up with the M15 M3 signal and reran the entire study with that model. I used two different dimensions to evaluate and compare the accuracy of the forecasts. The first dimension ranked the accuracy of each of the 12 forecasts and considers the number and percentage of the 430 data sets where one of the forecasts that included the seasonal influences is ranked number one or is ranked either number one or number two, both by MAPE and RMSE. The top two ranking offers a more accurate picture of the overall accuracy because often the difference in accuracy between the number one and number two rankings is razor thin. The second dimension compares the accuracy of each of the traditional models to the accuracy of the hybrid version that includes the seasonal influences. It considers the number and percentage of the 430 data sets where the hybrid seasonal forecast is more accurate than the traditional non-seasonal counterpart. For the purpose of this study, any result that falls within 20 percentage points of 50% is not significant. So if the forecasts that include the irregular seasonal influences are more accurate 60% or more of the time, there's clear value to incorporating these irregular seasonal influences. When considering the E3 forecasts, one of the seasonal forecasts ranked either number one or number two 67.67% .67 of the time by MAPE and 62.79% of the time by RMSE. The hybrid E3 forecasts were more accurate than the traditional forecast 71.3% of the time by MAPE and 66.93% of the time by RMSE. When considering the M3 forecasts, one of the seasonal forecasts ranked either number one or number two 74.65% of the time by MAPE and 70% of the time by RMSE. The hybrid M3 forecasts were more accurate than the traditional forecasts 74.37% of the time by MAPE and 72.33% of the time by RMSE. These results strongly suggest that including irregular seasonal influences can improve the overall accuracy of time series forecasting. As impressive as these results are, they're only part of the story. Because you have to combine the seasonal forecast with the traditional forecast to incorporate the irregular seasonal influences, seasonality is no longer an all or nothing proposition. Rather than combining the entire seasonal forecast, you can pick and choose the seasons with the greatest expected predictive value, the seasons with the lowest variance, and leave the rest of the forecast values unchanged. I call this targeted seasonality. To evaluate the accuracy of the targeted seasonality, I identified the seasons for each data set that had a variance of less than half of the mean variance for the entire data set. This created a subset of forecast dates for each data set. I then evaluated and compared the overall accuracy of the forecasts for only those dates. One of the targeted hybrid E3 forecasts ranked in the number one or number two position 79.07% of the time by MAPE, they ranked either number one or number two 79.3% of the time by RMSE. The targeted hybrid E3 forecasts were more accurate than their traditional counterparts, 77.26% of the time by MAPE and 77.21% of the time by RMSE. The targeted hybrid M3 forecasts ranked in the number one or number two position 77.91% of the time by MAPE. They ranked either number one or number two 80% of the time by RMSE. The targeted hybrid M3 forecasts were more accurate than their traditional counterparts, 77.53% of the time by MAPE and 77.02% of the time by RMSE. These results strongly suggest that the historical variance of the effect size of a season can be used to anticipate the relative value of that season to improve forecast accuracy. What's even more impressive is these results came from using a mercury-based irregular seasonal forecast signal that was by no means optimized. The limited scope of this study means that only the M15 sign and speed seasonal model has been shown to have value in forecasting. However, it's reasonable to expect that other irregular seasonal models would show similar improvements. At this point, I need to insert a disclaimer. This research does not in any way suggest that you can use this model to manage your investments or beat the stock market. But it does provide compelling evidence that it's time to revisit the idea and application of seasonality in time series analysis and forecasting. This video is just the highlights of the study, of course. The published research includes all of the findings and a complete description of the methodologies involved. It's available at most online booksellers, including Amazon. 
If you visit thescienceofastrology.com, you can download interactive Tableau workbooks with examples of the forecast data. And if you're interested in exploring this research on a deeper level, or if you'd just like to try to prove me wrong, you can request my original source files, including the raw data, the R scripts, and the Excel worksheets that calculate the accuracy and rank the results. I'm eager to partner with other researchers, data scientists, and businesses to explore the practical applications of these discoveries.